house around the garages. It's bizarre. Whereas here, these people are choosing to live in this suburb. They're paying more for their real estate. And they do, if they own a car, they have to park it in this car park place about two kilometers down the road. But most of them don't own a car because the community owns rental vehicles. And they can rent a car from the community any time they want to go away with their family. And the, the multi-story car park's got the covered in, um, the, the mouse works here, uh, covered in solar panels on the roof as well. So they're using every space. So this is a sort of suburb of the future where the car is not dominant and people are choosing to live there. In terms of global shares of current energy, the passengers are red and freight is blue. Road dominates on a global basis. Shipping is, dominates the freight and uh, air, of course, is mainly passengers as well. But certainly road dominates globally. And I don't know if you can see this very well. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a bug. Um, my voice will hopefully last for a while. Um, transport share of global energy related emissions are around 25% of the total energy related emissions of the world and that graph there shows that it's been increasing pretty rapidly from 1970 to 2006-7 that is and um, um, cars, uh, road transportation is, is the major one. It's only a draft diagram from the IPCC <coughs> but the point is that could double by 2035 uh, continued current rates of growth and then represent a significantly higher share. We can decarbonize the electricity sector, we can bring down the heat market, trying to change the transport market and decarbonize that is gonna be very difficult. From New Zealand's point of view, 40% of total sea material emissions come from road transport, energy related, and that's grown 66% since 1990, higher than the electricity emissions in fact. And the growth is still continuing. So rapid increase and we somehow or other got to try and turn that around. And where do these greenhouse gas emissions come from for transport? It's worth breaking it down. I think this presentation is going to be available at some stage later on, so I'm going through it quite quickly. You'll have a chance to review it at some later stage. But the fuel carbon intensity, the grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule of energy in the fuel, whether it's electricity or petrol or diesel or whatever, then we've got a choice of fuels there, and they've all got a different carbon intensity. Then we've got the energy intensity in terms of energy per kilometer or energy per ton kilometer per freight that's trans traveled. And then we've got the range of vehicles and how efficient is my diesel Peugeot car compared with your Mercedes Benz or whatever you've all got parked outside. How many walked here tonight? That's pretty impressive. How many got on the bicycles? Oh, that's pretty impressive too. How many came on the bus? Oh, that's not bad. How many drove the car? <laughs> Oh, that's nice of you to be on it. Two people, though. I can't hold it, I never like that. There's no public Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I can give you a ride home if you want. Okay, so that was that. Was, that was, that was, scooters? Oh, scooters. Oh, yeah, sorry, that was scooters. Yeah, right. That's pretty impressive. We're, so we're talking to the converted here, really, aren't we? And then the other way of reducing greenhouse gases is to reduce the number of journeys, whether it's freight or or um, mobility, and it's the distance we travel, can we combine trip objectives, can we avoid a journey, internet shopping, is that going to make a difference to the number of journeys we make, um, and certainly I'm using video conference, I do a lot of flying, I own a forest to absorb my CO2 so I can sleep at night, I'm carbon neutral, I can send you some carbon credits if you, if you want some, um, but uh, yeah, so, so uh, I'm doing a lot of video conference, Technology for that. I had a video conference in Rome just a few weeks ago. There were eight of us outside the room, seven, uh, seven or eight people inside the room, and we had a three hour conversation. It was splendid. We didn't need to travel to Rome. I had to get up in the middle of the night, but that was better than getting on an aeroplane and travel around the world. And the final point is a system infrastructure mode of choice, and that's urban planning, roads, uh, roading, track airports, etc. The important thing about this graph, and this is not being sort of clearly mentioned tonight, is that what is the choice when you have a, 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 an opportunity to go by different forms of transport? Why did some of you come on the bus? Why did some of you walk, etc., etc.? And the choice is not just cost, but it's speed, comfort, cost, and convenience. And those are the four things that people, the behavioural choice, are all revolving around that. So whether cost, if you increase fuel prices, it may or may not have an impact depending on how convenient or, or how comfortable your method of journey is. I'm 
running short of time here. Well to wheel greenhouse gas emissions relative to a petrol uh, light duty vehicle. This shows of all the different biofuels in electric vehicles, etc. I'll go through it reasonably quickly. That's the gasoline internal combustion engine vehicle. And, uh, and these are the other fossil fuel sort of vehicles, including CNG. And they're all a bit lower, and these are advanced technologies as well. They're all a bit lower than the standard vehicle. When we get into biofuels, there's a whole range in the green there. Some are good biofuels and some are not good biofuels. Come back to that briefly in a minute. In electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids, again, there's variety there. These come from a whole range of studies that, again, are put together into the IPCC report. And so it's sort of premature analysis, but the electric vehicle depends on where the electricity is coming from, what the greenhouse gas emission reduction is going to be. And these are the US data, and from the US grid, it's, it's reasonably high still because it's all coal-fired power. And if you get to a future zero carbon grid, then obviously the electric vehicle can have zero carbon emissions. But we're not there yet. And the light green on the far side is the hybrid, uh, uh, sorry, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, which may or may not compete with electric vehicles in the future. We simply don't know at this stage. A few trends. <coughs> Greenhouse gas emission reduction targets of these different countries listed down the bottom there, these countries have already got targets in place for reducing fuel emissions per kilometre from their light duty vehicles. And, and they're all going downwards and they're all going downwards quite rapidly. New Zealand doesn't have that at this stage. Look at South Korea here, that's one of them. I'll give you an example, I was just over there for a month, uh, just a few weeks ago, and Cheongyun Cheong River in Seoul is, this is a picture of it, but you may know the story that in 1970 they decided to cover the river over, turn it into a car park and build a motorway on top, and that's what it looked like. But the people didn't like it. So the mayor, the new mayor of Seoul, said, if you elect me, I'll take the motorway away. So he did. And there it is now. And I was wandering in through it. People were walking and framing that day, but people are using it. It's a public facility. And look, there's people strolling down. It's got greenery in the city. They've moved the motorway. And the traffic hasn't got congested as a result. Another key message here. Three minutes. Three minutes, okay, thank you. Another graph here with vehicle miles travelled per year. This is by age class and it's in the USA. And again, you're not going to be able to see the details, but the older you get on the right at the bottom, it goes from 16 to 20 years old on the left up to 88 years old on the right. And this is vehicles travel per person per year. And you can see the older you get, you travel less. But the red colour is 2009 compared with 2001 and 1995. And so the interesting thing is that people using cars less due to, what is it, higher fuel costs, better public transport, or is it social networking? Because it's the young people that have reduced the demand for, uh, for travel by car more than any other group. So do people not need to go and see each other if they can go on Skype or text message or whatever else you, you might want to do? So is that a change of, of uh, human behaviour? Impact of high oil prices I'm not going to talk about. Uh, we don't know what oil's going to do. It's likely to stay where it around where it is for the next few years, IEA analysis, etc. But it does impact on oil level, all, all levels of society. I saw this character when I was cycling through Paris. He was driving his Rolls Royce. He'd run out of this is when oil was $147 a barrel, and he obviously couldn't afford it. He had a very attractive French lady sitting in the passenger seat, not looking very happy at all. And he's putting cognac in the back of the vehicle there. It was cheaper than petrol at the time. Um, it was a classic shot, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Um, and it's recently been admitted that they're very unlikely to be able to meet that. 
Um, and there's about 300 Kiwi Rail employees currently um, facing losing their jobs as a result of, of all this. So um, our question was, should the government be investing more in rail? Um, and if so, how much? So that we'll hand it over to the MPs to answer. And uh, Phil, where do you go? Unfortunately, this government uh, never really showed any interest out of in, in um, rail as a, a public service in New Zealand, like as part of our transport infrastructure. It cannot be considered like a standalone business and expected to return a profit. That's not what we expect of the rest of our transport network. Why would we expect that of rail? I think that rail, um, you know, partly for the reasons that rail demonstrated it's going to become extremely important for moving freight and so is coastal shipping and we need um, a national strategy. We allocated um, about a billion extra dollars to uh, rail coastal shipping in our alternative plan but it may well need more than that but I think that if we start um, internalizing some of these external costs that haven't been borne by road <coughs> users we're going to find that there's actually we're able to create a more resilient economy and at the same time, we're going to raise revenue, which we can then invest in um, our rail system and, and in our and in coastal shipping, for that matter. So, QE Rail's turnaround plan, which is a, a plan to try to rescue the organisation and rebuild it after a couple of decades of um, asset stripping and neglect while it's in private ownership. Um, will will uh, aims to invest um, four point um, seven five billion dollars uh, into capital investment. The government's putting up seven hundred and fifty million of that. You know where the rest is coming from? Kiwi Rail's own balance sheet. The poor old thing can barely make that year by year. Somehow it has to find four point seven five, sorry, three point uh, seven five um, billion out of its own balance sheet. It's not going to happen. And um, the craziness of these financial uh, targets are driving the key realm to make some really appalling decisions. It's what is behind um, uh, El Chipo procurement decisions. Sourcing the cheapest possible Chinese locals that have been an utter disaster. Chinese wagons, rolling stock that could and should have been manufactured in New Zealand. Seven thousand rotten Peruvian rail servants are on the tracks around New Zealand at the moment. And Kiwi Rail have to go and find those Peruvian rail servants and take them off the tracks and replace them. And most bizarre, in my view, the decision to sack 181 workers and try to save $200 million by deferring three years of network maintenance on our rail system. And we revealed the leaked document. That really uh, Kiwi Rail's own report, internal report, that showed they are going to systematically and deliberately run down our national railway for the next three years in order to meet these crazy uh, financial targets. Nowhere else in the world does a country expect a national railway like this to be a standalone corporation generating a profit. It's simply stupid to expect. We have to regard rail as a vital part of our national transport infrastructure and fund it. Currently, the transport uh, budget is a kind of a muted triangle. 